നമസ്കാരം എൻ്റെ ഖബർ എന്ന ചെറിയ ഒരു പുസ്തകത്തിലെ ഒരു ഭാഗമാണ് ഞാൻ ആദ്യം വായിക്കാൻ പോകുന്നത് അജിത ആണ് അതിൻ്റെ എഡിറ്റിംഗ് നിർവഹിച്ചതെന്ന് പറയാം ഖബറിലെ ഇടയ്ക്കുള്ളൊരു ഭാഗമാണ് ഞാൻ വായിക്കുന്നത് ഇത് വളരെ എനിക്ക് ഏറ്റവും വായിക്കാൻ ഏറ്റവും ഇഷ്ടമുള്ള ഭാഗമാണ് എൻ്റെ വിവാഹമോചനവും അമ്മയുടെ വീട് മാറലും ഒരേ കാലത്തായിരുന്നു രണ്ടായിരത്തി പതിമൂന്നിലാണ് അമ്മ റിട്ടയർ ചെയ്തത് അതിന് ഏഴ് കൊല്ലം മുമ്പായിരുന്നു എൻ്റെ വിവാഹം കല്യാണത്തിന് രണ്ട് ദിവസം മുമ്പ് രാത്രിയിൽ അമ്മ എൻ്റെ മുറിയിൽ വന്നു കട്ടിലിൽ കൂടെ കിടന്നു മുതിർന്നതിന് ശേഷം അതാദ്യത്തെ അനുഭവമായിരുന്നു ഞാൻ ആഹ്ലാദത്തോടെ അമ്മയെ കെട്ടിപ്പിടിച്ചു നെഞ്ചിൽ തല വച്ചു അപ്പോൾ അമ്മ ഇടറിയ ശബ്ദത്തിൽ പറഞ്ഞു നിൻ്റെ കല്യാണത്തോടെ നാട്ടുനടപ്പനുസരിച്ച് അമ്മയെന്ന നിലയിൽ എൻ്റെ കടമയൊക്കെ മുക്കാലും കഴിഞ്ഞു അങ്ങനെ തീരുന്നതാണ് ഒരമ്മയുടെ കടമ ഞാൻ കൊഞ്ചി പിന്നെ തീരാതെ ഇനിയെന്താ ബാക്കി നീ പ്രസവിക്കുമ്പോൾ കുറച്ചു കാലം കൂടെ നിൽക്കണം കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങൾക്ക് മൂന്നാല് വയസ്സാകുന്നത് വരെ വേണ്ടി വന്നാൽ സഹായിക്കണം അത് കഴിഞ്ഞാലോ കാശിക്ക് പോകണം അമ്മ പറഞ്ഞു ഞാൻ ചിരിച്ചു അച്ഛൻ വന്നത് തന്നെ ഒറ്റയ്ക്ക് അച്ഛൻ സമ്മതിച്ചത് തന്നെ സമ്മതം ചോദിക്കലൊക്കെ അവസാനിപ്പിക്കുന്ന കാര്യമാണ് ഞാൻ പറയുന്നത് എനിക്ക് ഒന്നും മനസ്സിലായില്ല പക്ഷേ അമ്മയുടെ ശബ്ദം പൊന്തിയത് ഹൃദയത്തിൽ നിന്നായിരുന്നു എനിക്ക് എൻ്റേതായിട്ട് ഒരിടം വേണം ഭാവനെ അമ്മ എന്താ ഈ പറയുന്നത് ഞാൻ എഴുന്നേറ്റിരുന്നു അമ്മയും എഴുന്നേറ്റിരുന്നു പിന്നെ എൻ്റെ കയ്യിൽ പിടിച്ച് കണ്ണുകളിൽ നോക്കി വളരെ ഗൗരവത്തിൽ പറഞ്ഞു ഏഴ് കൊല്ലം കഴിഞ്ഞാൽ ഞാൻ റിട്ടയർ ചെയ്യും അപ്പോഴത്തേക്ക് എനിക്ക് ഒരു തുണ്ട് ഭൂമിയും ഒരു ഒറ്റ മുറി വീടും വേണം എനിക്കിഷ്ടമുള്ളത് പോലെ ഒരു മുറി ഞാൻ അസ്തപ്രജ്ഞയായിരുന്നു അമ്മ തുടർന്നു രാത്രി ഏഴ് മണിക്ക് ബസ് ഇറങ്ങി വീട്ടിലേക്ക് ഓടുമ്പോൾ ഞാൻ ചിലപ്പോൾ തനിച്ചേ കാണും എൻ്റെ കൂടെ വന്നിരുന്നത് ഒരു ആ ചെമ്പൻ പട്ടിയാണ് ആ പീസിൽ ചായയുടെ കടി ബാക്കിയുള്ളത് പാത്രത്തിൽ ഇട്ടുകൊണ്ടു വന്ന് ഞാനതിന് കൊടുത്തിട്ടുണ്ട് ഒരു ദിവസം നോക്കുമ്പോൾ വണ്ടി മുട്ടി കാലൊടിഞ്ഞു കിടക്കുന്നു കണ്ണിലൂടെ നീരൊഴുകുന്നുണ്ട് എനിക്ക് അത് കണ്ടുകൊണ്ട് നിൽക്കാൻ പറ്റിയില്ല ഞാൻ അതിനെ എടുത്തുകൊണ്ട് ഇവിടെ വന്നു ഞാൻ അങ്ങനെ ചെയ്തത് ഇത് എൻ്റെ വീടാണെന്ന് കരുതിയിട്ടാണ് അമ്മ എന്താ പിള്ളേരെ പോലെ ഇത് അമ്മയുടെ വീടല്ലേ അന്നാണ് എനിക്ക് മനസ്സിലായത് ഇതെൻ്റെ വീടല്ല എൻ്റെ ഇഷ്ടപ്രകാരം എനിക്കൊരു മിണ്ടാപ്രാണിയെ പോലും കൊണ്ടുവരാനോ താമസിപ്പിക്കാനോ ഒരു ദിവസം ഭക്ഷണം കൊടുക്കാനോ അവകാശമില്ല അമ്മ എന്താ ഈ പറയുന്നത് പട്ടിയെന്ന് പറയുന്ന ജീവിയെ അച്ഛൻ ഇഷ്ടമില്ലാഞ്ഞിട്ടല്ലേ എന്നാൽ നാളെ ഞാനൊരു മനുഷ്യ ജീവിയെ കൊണ്ടുവന്ന് കാണിക്കാം അമ്മ എന്താ ഈ പറഞ്ഞു വരുന്നത് അച്ഛന് അമ്മയോട് സ്നേഹമില്ലെന്നാണോ ഒരാളുടെ സേവനങ്ങൾക്ക് മറ്റൊരാൾ നൽകുന്ന പ്രതിഫലമല്ല സ്നേഹം അത് ഒരാൾ മറ്റേയാളിൽ കാണുന്ന കണ്ടെത്തുന്ന പൂർണ്ണതയാണ് എനിക്ക് അതൊരടിയായിരുന്നു ഞാനിതിപ്പോൾ പറഞ്ഞത് നിൻ്റെ സന്തോഷത്തെ കെടുത്താനാണെന്ന് വിശ്വസി വിചാരിക്കരുത് ഒരു മുന്നറിയിപ്പ് മാത്രമാണ് നിൻ്റെ പ്രായത്തിൽ ഞാൻ വിചാരിച്ചത് കുടുംബം എന്നത് സ്വർഗമാണെന്നാണ് കുറച്ച് കഴിഞ്ഞപ്പോൾ മനസ്സിലായി ഇതും ഒരു ജോലി സ്ഥലമാണ് ഇരുപത്തിനാല് മണിക്കൂർ ജോലിയാണ് ലീവില്ല പ്രൊമോഷനില്ല അങ്ങനെ ചില വ്യത്യാസങ്ങളേ ഉള്ളൂ ജോലി സ്ഥലത്ത് ഒരു ഗുഡ് സർവീസ് എൻട്രിയൊക്കെ കിട്ടിയെന്നിരിക്കും വീട്ടിനുള്ളിൽ ചെയ്തു കൊടുത്തതൊന്നും കണക്ക് പുസ്തകത്തിൽ കാണില്ല ചെയ്യാനുള്ളത് മാത്രമേ കാണൂ നിൻ്റെ ജീവിതം അങ്ങനെ ആകാതിരിക്കട്ടെ പക്ഷേ അങ്ങനെ ഒരു നിമിഷമുണ്ടാകാൻ ഇടയുണ്ട് എന്ന് മറക്കരുത് തളരാതിരിക്കുക But you know, uh, it's, it's interesting that Meera read this um, section because Bhavna's mother is actually across Ignite. all everything mm. I've read. I think, she's, I think she's one of my um, favorite characters in literature. You know, this woman who um, left her husband and, you know, went to live with her brood of dogs, uh, who is so fiercely political. She's so sorted out. You know, I mean, she's a, she's a quiet woman. She's... quietly fierce and um and um and you know the parallel like when i read because i read jezebel so soon after working on um kabar this was fresh in my mind uh, i was just telling you about valya machi and you know who is jezebel's grandmother and uh, you know the these these like older women that really they're so sorted in their heads like you know and they're so political like valyamachi is like frankly feminist you know um amma is like this rooted like you know she's she's a properly political animal 
Um, where do these women come from? Are they women you know? Uh, actually, they don't have to come. They are around us. <laughs> Only thing we, we don't uh, care to look for them and uh, identify them or recognize them or even acknowledge them. Uh, so, uh, the, the whole point in my writing is to write about the women we don't see usually in literature and films. We always see in, uh, in Malayalam films, you know, you see that uh, motherly, uh, typical, uh, the all-sacrificing mothers uh, who are waiting for their uh, children, husband, like that, no? But not all mothers. Right? The mothers I have seen are very powerful, very fierce, uh, very rude. <laughs> very rough, rough and very intelligent and well, well known. And uh, when I consider the older generation, so we all think that uh, our grandmothers uh, are less informed or less, uh, um, uh, less aware of the life around us. But I have seen that the older women, uh, as they grow old, they, they undergo a certain kind of evolution, an internal evolution, which makes them better and stronger uh, human beings compared to their male counterparts. Uh, they become more independent. They understand the meaning of real freedom. They understand the meaning of real, the life around them, uh, the nature, the people. Uh, so I, I, I think that, uh, that the women, many of the women who belong to the generation soon after the independence, they were more powerful because they had something to hope for. Yesterday we were, uh, I was talking uh, to um, uh, Sachid, Marsh Sachidanandan, poet Sachidanandan and he was saying the same thing. At that time there was something to look forward to. But now, as we grow old and uh, as we reach this point, we think that that ray of hope is being diminished or being dimming. That's interesting. She mentions that, you know, Valiyamachi is so strong in Jezebel. So in Jezebel... Shall I read that part? Of please do. And then I'll ask you the question. So I'll read a very brief part. കോടതിയിലെ ദീർഘമായ വിചാരണ കഴിഞ്ഞ് പുറത്തിറക്കുമ്പോൾ അവളുടെ ഹൃദയം നനഞ്ഞ ചാക്കുപോലെ ഭാരിച്ചു തൂങ്ങി ഒരാൾക്ക് മാത്രം നടക്കാൻ ഇടയുള്ള ഇടങ്ങിയ ഇടനാഴി ഒരു തുരങ്കം പോലെ കാണപ്പെട്ടു ആളുകൾക്കിടയിൽ ഇടിക്കുകയായിരുന്ന വല്യമ്മച്ചി വടികുത്തി നടന്നു വന്ന് അവൾക്ക് നേരെ അലിവോടെ കൈ നീട്ടിയപ്പോൾ ആ കരം ഗ്രഹിച്ചതല്ലാതെ ഒരു വാക്കെങ്കിലും പറയാൻ അവൾക്ക് ശക്തിയുണ്ടായില്ല അവൾ വല്യമ്മച്ചിയെ മുന്നിൽ നടക്കാൻ അനുവദിച്ചു കയ്യിൽ കൊളുത്തിയിട്ട ബെൽറ്റ് പിടിപ്പിച്ച വാക്കർ കുത്തി സാൽവാർ കമ്മീസ് ധരിച്ച വല്യമ്മച്ചി അതിവേഗം മുന്നോട്ട് നടന്നു വരാന്തയിലെത്തിയപ്പോൾ ജസബൽ കിതച്ചു പകൽ വെളിച്ചത്തിൽ അവളും വല്യമ്മച്ചിയും മുഖത്തോട് മുഖം നോക്കി ക്ഷീണിച്ചോടി കൊച്ചെ എന്ന് വല്യമ്മച്ചി കാരുണ്യം പ്രകടിപ്പിച്ചു അവൾ മന്ദഹസിക്കാൻ ശ്രമിച്ചു അപ്പോൾ അഡ്വക്കേറ്റ് ഫിലിപ്പ് മാത്യൂസ് അവളുടെ വക്കീൽ ഫീസിന് വേണ്ടി മാത്രമാണ് താൻ ഈ കേസ് ഏറ്റെടുത്തതെന്ന മുഖഭാവത്തോടെ അടുത്തു വന്നു അടുത്ത പോസ്റ്റിംഗ് ഒക്ടോബർ പതിനൊന്നിന് നാൽപ്പത് വയസ്സിൻ്റെ നരകയറിയ മുടിയിഴകൾ ഒതുക്കിക്കൊണ്ട് വക്കീൽ പറഞ്ഞു ഇത് എത്ര ദിവസം കാണും ഈ വിചാരണ വല്യമ്മച്ചി അയാളെ നേരിട്ടു അവർക്ക് ചോദിക്കാനുള്ളത് ഇന്ന് കഴിഞ്ഞു അവർക്ക് വേണ്ടത് മാത്രം ചോദിച്ചാൽ മതിയോ നമുക്ക് വേണ്ടതും പറയാൻ ഇടവേണ്ടായോ അത് അടുത്ത അവധിക്ക് ചോദിക്കും നമ്മുടെ റീയും എതിർഭാഗത്തിൻ്റെ വിസ്താരവും അന്ന് നടക്കും വല്യമ്മച്ചി നെടുവീർപ്പിട്ടു ഒന്ന് കെട്ടിയത് അഴിക്കാൻ ഇത് എന്നാ പാടാ വക്കീലേ കെട്ടുമ്പോൾ ഇതൊന്നും വേണ്ട താനും അല്ലയോ വല്യമ്മച്ചി മുറ്റത്തേക്കിറങ്ങാൻ ആയാസപ്പെട്ടു കെട്ടുന്നതിന് മുന്നേ ഇതെല്ലാം നടത്തേണ്ടിയത് ഫീസ് അടച്ച് രജിസ്റ്റർ ചെയ്യണം വക്കീലന്മാരെ ഏർപ്പെടുത്തണം കല്യാണം കഴിക്കേണ്ടവനെയും കഴിക്കേണ്ടവളെയും ചോദ്യം ചെയ്ത് അവരുടെ മനസ്സിലിരുപ്പ് പിടിച്ചെടുക്കണം പിള്ളേരുണ്ടാകുമോ ഇല്ലയോ വേണ്ടായോ എന്നൊക്കെ പരിശോധിക്കണം എത്ര സ്വത്തുണ്ട് ഇനി ഉണ്ടാക്കുന്ന സ്വത്ത് ആർക്ക് എത്രയൊക്കെ എന്ന് തീരുമാനിക്കണം ശരീരത്തിനോ മനസ്സിനോ ദീനമുണ്ടോ എന്ന് മനസ്സിലാക്കണം എന്ന് എന്നിട്ട് ജഡ്ജി പറയണം ആ ഇവർ തമ്മിൽ കെട്ടട്ടെ അല്ലേൽ ഇവർ തമ്മിൽ കെട്ടണ്ട വല്യമ്മച്ചിയുടെ ശബ്ദമുയർന്നു വരാന്തയിൽ നിന്ന് ആളുകൾ തിരിഞ്ഞു നോക്കി ജസബൽ മുറ്റത്തിറങ്ങി വല്യമ്മച്ചിയുടെ കരം ഗ്രഹിച്ചു അപ്പോൾ ഒരു പ്രധാന കാര്യം എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞ് വക്കീൽ വരാന്തയുടെ അറ്റത്തേക്ക് കുറച്ചുകൂടി നീങ്ങി നിന്നു അതെ റീ എക്സാമിന് വരുമ്പം കുറച്ചുകൂടി ഡീസൻ്റായിട്ട് വരണം കേട്ടോ ജസബലിൻ്റെ മുഖം വിളറി അവൾ സ്വന്തം ശരീരത്തിലേക്ക് നോക്കി ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞത് അവിടെ ഡ്രസ്സിൻ്റെ കാര്യമൊക്കെ ചോദിച്ചത് കേട്ടില്ലായിരുന്നു ഈ ജീൻസും ഷർട്ടും വേണ്ട കേസൊക്കെ കഴിഞ്ഞ് മുടി മുറിച്ചാൽ മതിയായിരുന്നു അതുപോട്ടെ ഏതായാലും ഇനി വരുമ്പം സാരി എടുത്ത് വന്നാൽ മതി അല്ലേൽ പിന്നെ വല്യമ്മച്ചിയെ പോലെ ചുരിദാറിട്ട് പോരെ പക്ഷെ ഷാളിടണം കേട്ടോ ജസബൽ അന്തം വിട്ടു അയാൾ ജാള്യത്തോടെ ചിരിച്ചു 
ജഡ്ജിയുടെ ഇമ്പ്രഷൻ വളരെ പ്രധാനമാണ് ഇപ്പം തന്നെ അത് പോയി ഇനിയുള്ളതും കൂടെ കളയണ്ട അത് ശരി തുണിമണിയൊക്കെ നോക്കിയാണോ വക്കീല് ജഡ്ജിമാർ കേസ് വിധിക്കുന്നത് വക്കീല് വലിയ മച്ചി പരിഹാസത്തോടെ ചിരിച്ചു വക്കീൽ ചമ്മി അങ്ങനെയല്ല മച്ചി വലിയ മോഡേണായ പെണ്ണ് എന്നൊക്കെ പറഞ്ഞാൽ തന്നെ ഒരു പ്രിജുഡീസാകും അതുകൊണ്ടാണ് വലിയ മച്ചി കൂടുതൽ ഉറക്കെ ചിരിച്ചു ഞങ്ങളുടെയൊക്കെ വല്യമ്മച്ചിമാരുടെ കാലത്ത് തുണി ഉടുക്കുന്നവരായിരുന്നു കൊച്ചനെ മോഡേൺ ഞങ്ങളുടെയൊക്കെ അമ്മമാരുടെ കാലത്ത് സാരി ഉടുക്കുന്നതും ബ്ലൗസ് ഇടുന്നതും വലിയ മോഡേൺ ആയിരുന്നു ഞങ്ങളുടെയൊക്കെ കാലത്ത് ബ്രേസിയറിൻ്റെ ഒരു വള്ളിയെങ്ങാനും പുറത്ത് കണ്ടാൽ പിന്നെ പോയങ്ങ് തൂങ്ങി ചത്താൽ മതി പിന്നെ പിന്നെ ബ്രേസിയർ ഇടാത്തത് വലിയ കുറ്റമായി എന്നിട്ട് ഇപ്പോഴെന്നതാ ബ്രേസിയർ മാത്രം ഇടുന്നതല്ലയോ മോഡേൺ അത്രയേ ഉള്ളൂ മോഡേൺ എന്നും പഴഞ്ചനെന്നും ഒക്കെ പറയുന്നതിൻ്റെ അർത്ഥം നിങ്ങൾ വക്കീലന്മാർ വേണ്ടായോ അതൊക്കെ ജഡ്ജിമാർക്ക് പറഞ്ഞു കൊടുക്കാൻ വക്കീൽ ഗതി കെട്ട ഒരു ചിരി ചിരിച്ചു അത് കാണാൻ നിൽക്കാതെ വലിയ മച്ചി പടിക്കെട്ടിന് നേരെ നടന്നു ജസ് ജസബൽ വലിയ മച്ചിയെ പടിക്കെട്ട് കയറാൻ സഹായിച്ചു Valiya Machi is such a strong character, obviously, yeah. like Ajitha was saying, sorted in her head. And, but, and she's an example in front of Jezebel. Yet, Jezebel meekly toes the line, yeah. in a sense. You know, she marries, and then, of course, she comes out of it later, etc. But then, several years have passed, and, you know, a whole lot of violence has been done to her. How does that happen? You have this strong woman figure in front of you. Because yet, uh, there is one more woman, woman in between them. yeah uh, there is one more woman in between these two women no valiyamachi and uh, jezebel and that is jezebel's mother she is actually uh, uh, the the uh, uh, the um, that uh, torch bearer of patriarchy <laughs> so that is that is what happened so uh, it is not about uh, it's not it, not all the power uh, struggles within a family are between males and females or uh, men and women it's it's always between uh, one one pole of power and with the other so who was uh, this mother looking up to she didn't get her values from her yeah religion. she is looking up to religion so this is kind of her, that the, her notion of life her notion of patriarchy is being an endorsed and enforced by the religion she believes in and she thinks there is no life uh, beyond that so the, the religion every religion i understand uh, is about um, conserving or preserving uh, the uh, rules of the society the institution of the society so without any the without institutions uh, religion or even power or even government don't have any existence no institutions made by men for men essentially yeah yeah <laughs> actually i mean related to that um it's so you know i mean all these women that we're talking about that are so strong in her own way jezebel too you know i mean we're here talking about a middle class milieu we're talking about very empowered women you know whether it's bhavna who's a judge or jezebel who's a doctor who reads a lot she has an inner imagination she has you know all of this um they are still functioning within a structure of patriarchy so you know we have like say bhavana's mother whom we spoke of a little while ago who spends a lifetime with a very difficult unappreciative husband before she moves on we have jezebel who lives for two years with an execrable man you know who basically tortures her um and denies her and gaslights her like <laughs> you know all of that and there is the patience of these women you know who are waiting it out who are pushing their even bhavana with her husband she really waits it out you know finally i mean there's a point when it when the marriage ends but it is the structure of patriarchy that also enables the patience right i mean it's yeah the problem is that um, for their generation or for even our generation till very recently we didn't have models of uh, success from uh, this liberated women the women you see around us we, we didn't have a kind of success models no that is a that's a very important thing you can say that uh, you can be empowered but after that so what will happen 
so with the same society with the same uh, <laughs> rules uh, around us um, how long can you go that, that though with those chains that was a very important question um, uh, when you when you think about bhavana's mother she actually uh, reformed herself um, after by reading by thinking and being uh, being updating uh, and by updating herself whereas Bhavana actually um, comes to that point in a very, she was also reluctant to, to move out of the so-called uh, very celebrated uh, um, comfort, uh, comfort zone of the family. But then, uh, it, it, then uh, she also eventually moved out. And about, um, when you come to Jezebel, um, Jezebel also, she knows what should not be there, but she didn't know what should be there. Uh, that's a problem. So that's the way we we have been uh, being uh, brought up, uh, being trained and all. So if, when I come to the next novel, Khadagan, uh, uh, the 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 protagonist's mother uh, says that say the protagonist asks her mother, "You are very smart. You have you are very knowledgeable. Then why didn't you uh, revolt even earlier?" Uh, so she says um, that is because we were conditioned in that way. So this conditioning has an effect on all of us. We, were, we are all conditioned, no? And then uh, there is another thing which I have noticed that uh, this middle class actually even uh, be, just because you are educated or uh, you are financially um, stable, it won't let you go. Middle class is kind of uh, um, a big, big, big... Uh, 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 how to how to express it? I don't know. It's a Python. it is it is a Titan or it is kind of a um, hundred with a it has a hundred heads. No, uh, you you deal with one head and one uh, set of uh, hands. Then another head and another uh, set of hands will be a, <laughs> kind of withholding you or uh, uh, tying you up. So it is not easy to escape the Indian middle class and its rules. It's a big university <laughs> where you are constantly being, uh, yeah. And a lot of this conditioning happens through the media, yeah. right? The media feeds patriarchy and, you know, the, and the patriarchal system reproduces itself again and again. So now my question to you is given that films you know, uh, newspapers, perhaps even popular books, they're all feeding into patriarchy. If as a person you want to bring up uh, a progressive young man, you know, who believes in uh, empowerment of women or equality of women, how does one do that? Where does one look for models, like you're saying, if there aren't any in media or film or literature? Yeah, luckily, I see many uh, young men uh, being... Uh, being uh, Ruined by my books. <laughs> Spoiled by my books. You won't believe, but uh, one of my aunts, uh, she petted a lawn, she came to me. And so we were meeting after such a long time. And I said, uh, uh, I asked her about her son. So she said, Oh, you didn't know. Arnile Mira, Avenda Kairiam. Uh, so I said, no, I, 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 what happened to him? I thought something very terrible happened to him. He said, he has become a feminist, Mira, after reading your books. <laughs> he's gone. He doesn't, he don't even, he doesn't even let me to watch his play, plates, no? Which is <laughs> kind of, I, so she was accusing me of uh, turning his, uh, turning her son into a feminist. But I said, I'm very proud of him because uh, that was the only living uh, example of my success story. <laughs> but I think it's all changing. See, uh, the books, uh, the readers who come to us uh, after reading my books, uh, mm, uh, the major, major uh, number belongs to my daughter's generation. So, people ask me why, what, what uh, appeals to the younger generation, uh, and I will say that uh, they are living uh, the world I have always dreamed of. No. Uh, it was it was their world I was dreaming of, and I want to make it a better world. 
I don't, I can't, uh, I can't even claim that uh, I have lived my life as fully or completely as I wanted. But I think if uh, they could live uh, the kind of life I had dreamed of, then uh, my writings are not in vain. I, I mean, you know, when you were talking earlier, that's what I was thinking. I was thinking of like, say, the Me Too movement, you know, where this whole thing of why, why after two years, is, I mean, that is a question that came up and was answered, you know. So, I mean, it is what you're saying, that, um, that the younger generation is questioning the yeah. mores that you and I grew up with. Yeah. Um, but also, like in Kerala, your books are bestsellers. Yeah. It's not just the younger people that are reading it. Yeah. How yeah. are you selling feminist books, <laughs> feminist novels in Kerala? <laughs> See, uh, yesterday, Damodar uh, um, he, he was when we met, he asked me about uh, my next book. And I said, uh, I'm writing one book. And then immediately he asked me, is that to a feminist book? <laughs> so, so I told him, uh, all good literature are feminist books. If it is a good book, it should be a feminist book. <coughs> because feminism is all about uh, equal opportunity, equality, uh, fraternity, whatever uh, our uh, preamble of constitution says, that is exactly what is feminism also seeking for. So uh, you can't uh, write against uh, the basic principles of human life, human dignity, and then you can say that you are writing good literature. So all good writers should be feminist and are feminist, uh, even if they don't want to acknowledge that. And uh, when you come to uh, the Kerala scene, actually, I am very happy that uh, uh, you see a lot of women uh, being aware of their rights and their life, their, uh, their, um, their dreams and their needs more than ever. And they are not ashamed to, uh, to accept it, okay, or to uh, confess it. <laughs> so I think the, the, the most important thing uh, I have noticed in Kerala society is that among Malayalis, uh, the polarization is between uh, a, the people who know their rights and they, they have, are aware of the injustice they are facing and the other part who try to deny this. So the intellectual disparity between uh, the, those who have privileges and those who don't have those privileges are widening. And I don't know in the next step how uh, the Kerala society is uh, going to handle uh, this, um, these women, those, these girls uh, of this, this, my daughter's generation who are well aware of their rights and their space. It will be very difficult unless they have to change. And that change will happen, should happen, and I believe that it is happening. See, we, if you look at the films, literature, everywhere there is a deliberate effort from the makers uh, to not to underestimate or not to um, underplay the rights of women and the marginalized classes. That's very important. Yeah. I just want to ask you a slightly a question with a slight historical perspective, right? Uh, I mean, being from Kerala myself, we all took great pride in Kerala's human development indicators, sex ratio, or the fact that you know matrilineal society was a big part of Kerala. So all of this should have happened much earlier, you know, given the makeup of Kerala society, education, and so on. And it's yet I happened. Think there late. again, I have an uh, objection that it had happened earlier. Mm -hmm. You look at the 1930s writings by women. Mm. by men. They were all very aware of uh, the human rights and uh, uh, women's rights and um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the kind of a better society as we always want to have. No. But then uh, I think that uh, when you move uh, forward uh, that uh, wheel has to touch the same points twice. So there is kind of a, a turning back. Uh, maybe this is to move forward, a little more forward. I am very optimistic about this. Uh, 
but change is happening and it will happen there will be forces uh, which will uh, try to hold back but then we will have to move again no to have to move ahead there is no other way you can't stop where you are you will move so the battle will be eternal is, yeah know? Yeah, that is fought in different times and on different contexts. I think uh, sometimes this um, holding back or uh, kind of moving back is one way uh, a, a good indication that it will help us to dart forward. No? You know, I mean, maybe no. I can. I, I can think. For example, when this um, uh, some issues happen, Shabari Mala issue happen. It, it helped in, in a way that it exposed uh, the real problem of our society and then it helped a lot of uh, uh, people to come forward and understand what the problem is. So those people who are willing to change and willing to understand the uh, life around them, it helped, th uh, this, this issue, this controversy helped a lot. So everything has a positive and a negative thing and I am I'm still optimistic. That optimism is just, I mean, uh, is probably what keeps you going. Because I remember reading in one of your interviews, um, and I love the metaphor, you said that you're a small pot. Yeah. <laughs> Will you say it in Malayalam? I'll spoil it. I a fiction That's what I said. I, I hope I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for those yeah. who don't know Malayalam, she describes herself as a small flower pot, and her novels is like the trees that are planted in that. So, as the tree grows, no, of course the flower pot will break, crumble, and I'm crumbling uh, grain by grain. <laughs> it happens. But there's also the optimism to keep you going. Yeah, there is. Uh, See, what I was say, uh, talking about this, uh, this uh, flower pot tree metaphor came from uh, my understanding of uh, writing fiction. So earlier we used to think that writing fiction is very easy, uh, telling a story is very easy. But uh, after some time, I realized that uh, to tell a new story, you need uh, not only the story, but the stamina to tell it in a different way. Uh, to stamina to engage the readers. Uh, so you have to find out new words, new expressions, uh, new themes, new plots, uh, everything new. And after a while it is, it is quite a labor uh, to deliver what you want to. And in that process, something happens to you. You are uh, physically, mentally, uh, spiritually, uh, that uh, transformation uh, is the real pleasure of writing, I think. I don't think I understood uh, the real pleasure of writing uh, in the days I, I began writing. In those days, it was very easy. There were many stories uh, um, I might have collected from uh, the life, uh, my life, my surroundings and all. But after a while, it uh, reached that point where you are kind of uh, liberating from yourself. It is kind of uh, molding, uh, undergoing a molding, like a snake uh, molds its exoskeleton, no? uh, shedding your, uh, the framework which had been holding you till then. You are becoming a new you <laughs> with a concept of uh, new world, new life, uh, with a new insight into human beings. And uh, as I write uh, uh, more, uh, and I, I complete uh, every, every book, I realize that uh, all human beings are very lovable. Uh, earlier I could have, uh, I, I would think that there are certain things I don't like about human, humans, no, <laughs> sapiens. But I think they're all, uh, they all demand compassion. They all really need uh, compassion. We need to understand them. It is just like uh, understanding the nature. So unless you understand the nature, you can't, uh, you can't tame it. Just like that. So I'm sure there's lots of criticism of what you write. Right? Feminism must be contested by. So is this how you deal with your critics? With compassion? Yeah, or do you hit them. back also at times? I love them. 
<laughs> I love my critics and their criticism because uh, criticism also comes from uh, a kind of uh, uh, kind of <coughs> appreciation and understanding. Mm. What is the kind of criticism that you faced? Uh, I mean, one, one you said your aunt said you made my son a feminist. But what other kinds of uh, criticism have you faced, and how have you dealt with it? Yeah, the. Uh, most of the criticism, uh, I can translate that uh, like uh, not understanding me or my writing. It is not, uh, I can't communicate to them. That's my failure, no? So I can't uh, blame them completely for uh, their criticism. I think that I couldn't communicate to them effectively. So it happens. There are people around us uh, who won't understand what we say. It's not because the language is incomplete. Not only because language is incomplete or words are incomplete, but also because uh, they have some, some uh, less capability, lesser capability to understand others. So not all uh, people, as Madhavi Kuti, Kamala Suraya has written, Snehikanola Kadiva Chalaman Sharku Kuravayirikim. That is, the ability to love must be less for some people. So you have to understand the world belongs to them also. Uh, see, we are really, uh, uh, we have reached, uh, as a nation, as a people, we have reached a time where um, all the values we have been uh, taught till uh, our, till uh, uh, 20 years ago or 15 years ago have changed. It is all ulta, ulta, no? <laughs> Everything changed, no? Uh, this, uh, our values, the concept of uh, heroes, heroism, everything has changed. But still, uh, we can't uh, blame them for that because it must be the way the, the world belongs to them also. They, they also demand a space in this world. You can't just eliminate them or... Uh, we can only transform them. And for that, you have to communicate. You have to keep on telling stories. If this story doesn't appeal to them or change them or purifies them, you have to invent another story. This is our... Uh, Real challenge, I think. You know, uh, Mira, when you talk about critics and when you talk about empathy, I think the closest reading a book gets is probably from the translators, you know? And you've Pardon? been in from your translator. What? That's the closest reading of your book. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, you've been translated into English, of course, but other languages too. Yeah. And I, you know, because when you were reading Khabar and Jezebel, you know, I was hearing the Malayalam of both, like, together. And I was thinking of the English translations that I've read them in. And it's clear to me that both sets of, I mean, Nisha, as well as the two translators of Jezebel, have very different approaches to both your text and to translation. And um, I... I thought it was very interesting because to me they're both mirrors like I read two yeah. mirrors you know even though they both read differently perhaps in the English in their way but they're both mirrors absolutely to me and I was thinking how does this work for you you know do you think of translation as a collaborative thing that you do with the translators uh, how do you see their reading of the text? See I am very possessive about my books uh, and my words because I am so uh, so uh, concerned about the ideas it uh, convey. So I don't want the ideas to be distorted or changed or anyway, uh, in any way changed or um, from what I want to. So I work closely with my translators, of course. Um, I follow them line by line, word by word, sound by sound, <laughs> uh, syllable by syllable. So it's kind of uh, part, unless it appeals to me and it it uh, satisfies me, uh, I won't be happy with the translation. And uh, I want uh, my books to be different from one another. Uh, maybe after uh, some years, suppose the government bans all the books and all the bylines. And uh, <laughs> if uh, uh, they just uh, uh, pass a ruling that no book shall have, that li uh, have bylines from here onwards, what will happen to my books? My book won't have that byline, no. You, you might read the story and uh, not knowing who wrote it. I would like to, uh, to 
I am looking forward to that day when a reader will pick up each of my book and read as if it is written by different people. Actually, they were written by different people. I was not the same me when I was writing each of them, no? So that's a dream. That will be interesting, no? You will read one of my book and uh, you'll think it will be written by a man or a uh, trans person or uh, someone, uh, a woman. But you won't understand what kind of person who wrote it. But Mira, also, it's a fact that you're a really good mimic. So yeah. you really... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, this is uh, very important. Uh, I, I realized that after uh, writing a few books, I realized that I am not one person. I am different, I'm different uh, persons in a common shell. <laughs> you mentioned a, a hypothetical situation where books are banned, etc. It could be. Yeah, sure. How? No, Why? So if what you I say that ask... uh, one, uh, one language, one nation, one government, one nation, <laughs> one state, one nation. If there can't be one book, one nation. Why can't be? Why not? Yeah. <laughs> no, my question to you was, uh, besides this kind of banning or censorship from the state, right? Uh, what is also increasingly being talked about is self-censorship, right? Uh, you want to write something, but you fear some kind of See, backlash. When I am, I am really... Uh, uh, I fear for, I really fear for you publishers, not for myself, <laughs> because I can write anything. <laughs> the, the real... Uh, no, you really think so, don't you, unconsciously, or maybe your fellow it writers, is there, of is there it self-censorship? It's there. You do think that uh, we can't, uh, we can uh, live without fear like that? No. It has always been there. It is still there. It will be there. But still, we have to find a, find a way to overcome that. How do you do that? I mean, what is, what is playing in your mind? Let's say a, a sentence or a story or an incident which you've conceived in your mind, which no, you fear. No, while writing, I am the most fearless person. I am not uh, afraid of anyone or anything. Because uh, I can't write and uh, fear at the same time, no? Uh, but after writing, especially after publishing, I feel very, very uh, stressed and uh, um, I, I read and reread to find out whether there will be anything uh, to be, yeah, problematic. Because that's not for myself alone. I don't want to put my publisher in a, uh, a plot, in a, my readers. I see, I'm, I'm very serious about this. Uh, so we have reached a point where we have to be afraid of these things. Of course there is this paranoia, of course, of course there is this censorship, everything. But censorship is also, I mean, self-censorship self is also yes. of different kinds. Yes. I mean, there is, of course, the, the worry about, I mean, the state, yeah. the, you know, the powers, whatever. And then there is the fear of our own people, yeah. like our own politics, politics we agree with. Is there something that I'm saying that will, um, you know, that in any way reinforces a politics I don't believe yeah. in? Is that Some, also... Something seen as anti-feminist. For instance. For instance. Or like, I mean, Jezebel, the, the trans... Feminist. No, I don't... Feminist. Something that yeah. you write may be seen as that. that yeah, way. yeah. But one can uh, uh, interpret in anything in any way, no? You can... Uh, just like you think that um, I stand for uh, the rights of women, someone else can argue and establish that I am against that. That is quite natural. That is no... Uh, you can't fear that and... <laughs> Uh, the, right at the same time. See, I am what I am. I have been like this. I, as I told you, I am also an evolving person. Uh, my, my understanding of life, people, everything has changed from where I have started. It might change again. What if uh, I get uh, dementia from tomorrow onwards? I'll be a different person. I may look the same, but I'll be a different person. So that possibility is also are there. Then I might write a completely different story. Who knows? And I'm quite worried about that also. So my, I have told my daughter uh, not to let me give interviews uh, after uh, three or four years. No, <laughs> That's very early. <laughs> Uh, when was, you were growing up, when you were a young writer, you know, uh, and a reader, obviously, who were your literary 
influences? Who were the writers you looked up to? Read Almost a great all deal? writers. I, I, I am. I am very. Um, I am very fortunate, or I am very. Um, uh, I can say that whatever I have read have uh, strengthened me, uh, empowered me, uh, have uh, uh, made me grow. I have always Anyone, taken something from Any writers era. you want to name or any books you want to name? Uh, the the uh, Marquis writings were the, my favorite. My, that, that was my dream writings in those days. Then I started with um, most of the Malayalam writers there. Um, I, I was uh, poetry also. ONV, Kurpa, Sukhudagumari, then Kunjan Nambiar, Kumar Nash, and everything I used to. Uh, I wanted a writer uh, till I was about 17 years old. I thought I am going to become a writer. Then I thought, okay, there are many be very, very good writers at that time. So I stopped writing and I became a journalist. Uh, it was at that time, <coughs> Sachimash also were all there, you know, they were all writing good poetry. So I couldn't uh, uh, compete in co poetry. <laughs> so, so after a while, I thought of expressing myself just for myself. And then it accidentally it got published and then I became a published writer and I started writing again. That's how I became a writer. Even today, I think I, I shouldn't have a writer, uh, shouldn't have been a writer. A published writer. <laughs> I could write for myself. <laughs> I strongly disagree with that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but you know, I was wondering um, if anyone had any questions or comments or anything that, uh, whether we should take any of that in, if there was anything. Questions? Anybody would like to ask? Yes, please. Do you want to borrow one of us? No, but Can you speak up hear. a little bit? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you will get a mic. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I love the way you said, like, uh, I don't know the person when I was writing. Like, maybe they're female or else male or else something. So at the same time, I love the uh, uh, you know change which has come from the woman, from my mother to my sister, then my friend, then maybe the future generations. At the same time, I really don't understand the term called feminism, which is instead of on the contrary, I love the word called humanist way. Like, why don't you instead of call a feminist, why don't you call a human? What's what's your name? Timaraj, ma'am. Timaraj. Timaraj. Yeah. At the same time, you know most of the. Uh, Young generations, like uh, maybe my age or 20 to 30, those are the girls who mich, uh, really misunderstood the or else misinterpretation of the word called feminism. Okay, so what's I think your we understood take you. You've got your question. Yeah, yeah. the question. Yeah. See, it's not an issue with, the, uh, it's a no problem with the feminism that you misunderstand. Those who misunderstand it doesn't make feminism, doesn't cancel feminism. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my question is this, humanism or feminism or whatever you say, do you believe in our, uh, the, in our constitution, the preamble of our constitution? Do you think uh, everyone should have equal opportunity? E you should, you, you don't think so? You don't think everyone? No, no, if, do you believe that everyone should have equal opportunity? Yeah, right. then you are a feminist. <laughs> That's all. That's what I am saying. <laughs> That's a simple thing. If you believe in Indian constitution, you have to be a feminist. <laughs> Those who are not feminists do not believe in Indian constitution. That's all. <laughs> you can carry on this discussion offline. Yeah. I mean, she's given you a response. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions, please? Yes, please. Can we have the mic here, please? Hello, ma'am. Yes. Uh, I am Girish. Hello. Uh, let me begin with a confession that, you know, uh, I am a Malayali, but I am born and brought up in Andhra. So I started reading Malayalam very recently, and I have been dabbling in your writings only for the last, you know, few months. Yeah. So I read somewhere that Sarpa Yajnam was your 
first story published story story yeah after uh. after uh, um, actually it was published when i was 31 years old okay so i my first story technically the first story published was when i was 14 years old okay so it was afterwards i didn't publish anything nobody published any any of this thing i became a journalist and all so it was after uh, i became a journalist and i was established as a journalist that my story go got published quite accidentally it was not that i wanted to publish it okay yeah i i read that your husband sent it yeah. to surprise you oh, yeah. the husbands okay. are always like that no <laughs> they were <laughs> and you yeah. fought with him also yeah. excellent <laughs> yes <laughs> that was just another excuse <laughs> to fight so with. i was thinking this was a first uh, major story yeah, so that i was, was think yeah uh, my question was the way you introduce the sufferings of that lady and the uh, you know you start somewhere like this that happened on the the day uh, another day when she came to sleep in the living room yeah and uh, no actually to spend the sleepless night you yeah. you start like that yeah. and then you narrate this it 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 was an effortless narration yeah. and the snake enters into the story uh, being as a my question was since i thought it was a first story for you yeah. how did you make the snake come in matlab for a novice writer or a beginner to you know that was i felt it was a complex thing thank you that was really <laughs> thank you i take it as a compliment <laughs> but there is a very interesting uh, uh, trigger for that story Mm, uh, one day uh, one day i i we, at that, in those days we were living in a rented house and it has a bathroom outside the house so uh, it was the evening and uh, i i didn't have to go to for the work that was a an off day and so i went to uh, uh, take a bath during the um, uh, in the evening and i stepped in the bathroom it was dark inside and i stepped on to something very cold so i thought it must be some twain or my my uh, daughter was very small that is i thought she must have put some rope piece of rope or uh, twain there i stepped on that and it was very cold and then i moved my uh, feet and then it just crawled over my uh, feet and uh, it <laughs> that was an experience that's the first time a snake it was a very small baby snake no it crawled over my feet uh put me so i was i i didn't realize what was happening to me but that was a very strange sensation have you ever experienced that a snake crawling over you it has scales underneath and so you have a very uh, it's a rough and uh, it's like a um, a sandpaper like uh, uh, feeling at the same time is very cold you can't express it in one word or one sentence so that day i was wondering why it didn't, didn't bite me it was a black snake that means it must be um, uh, poisonous uh, so after coming uh, to my room it haunted me and i just wrote down i thought of a suddenly it, the fantasy you know i don't know why i wrote it i i, I wrote the thing without thinking much but uh, that's how it happened and that that story was uh, published uh, in a purely unedited form the just it was a rough draft which was published that's why it was so lengthy i think I, if i had uh, an opportunity to edit it i mean uh, one by third of the story <laughs> kanarundo neela niram that is uh, the the woman has been uh, you have to infer i i won't i won't i won't give it up <laughs> no 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 <laughs> you shouldn't ask the other for the meaning of uh, uh, the story <laughs> any other questions please this one there can i request someone to give the mic there yeah. behind hello yes hi uh, i really enjoyed this conversation i haven't read any of your books and i don't read malayalam but i'm looking forward to so you are not spoiled <laughs> 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 or i love to be yeah. uh, so i had two questions the first is 
For an English reader to read one of your books, uh, would you uh, recommend or suggest uh, any one of your books to start and which would it be? And uh, my second question is, uh, you know, so you said something very beautiful that uh, when you wrote and you started writing, you really reached a point of evolution in, uh, you know, the way you thought and uh, spiritually, psychologically. And uh, what would be some baby steps, uh, you know, for someone new to writing to start that process and, you know, put it in paper that it becomes that process for us too? Thank you. Yeah, there are, it, it's a, a number of questions at the, in a single question, no? Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to answer all of them. But um, I, won't, I won't suggest any of my books for you to read. You have to find it out. Okay. Because e each book is different. Uh, it was created by a different uh, Mira uh, at different points of time, no? So it's like that. I can't, I can't choose a book. It's okay. like uh, choosing uh, a Mira who was 20 years old or 30 years old or 50 years old. All are Miras. And uh, you have to find out uh, with whom you can be comfortable with or with uh, who is interesting to you. And the second question, when you start writing, when you want to write, uh, you have to write. There is no other way to find out whether you are a writer or not. You have to write, uh, wait for some time, read it again, uh, then write again and rewrite again. See, people think that writing is an easy job. It's not. Take it from me, it, is, it requires a lot of physical labor. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, torturing yourself uh, by speaking to yourself, by dissecting yourself, by pricking yourself, uh, kind of uh, uh, killing yourself and then uh, uh, resurrecting yourself. It's not an easy, easy task. Unless you are comfortable with yourself and unless you can patiently uh, wait uh, like uh, you want to uh, plant a seed and see a big tree uh, growing up. You don't see the tree grow up, no? Uh, it grows very silently, but you have to see it, you wait for it patiently. So, unless you have that patience, obstinacy to, to, um, to give up all your other pleasures, you can't be a writer. Thank you. Yes. Are you still motivated think, to write? I think, I think yes. I <laughs> more in fact. That's <laughs> wonderful. But I, I, I promise you that uh, once you understand the pleasure of writing, uh, there is nothing which can uh, spoil your... No one can ever uh, defeat you or uh, um, can... Uh, there's nothing more than that. Wow, thank you yeah. very much. Thanks. Any other questions? One last question before I wrap up. Since you spoke no, about yeah. my question, <laughs> yeah. since you spoke about uh, you know uh, the process, I somehow I don't. When you ask me questions, no, I don't get the answers very quickly. But when they ask, <laughs> I, <get> <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what is your writing process like? Uh, do you have? Do you keep regular hours? Do you, no. or do you write whenever you feel like it? Just give us a glimpse of how your how you do your writing. Yeah, uh, the normal way or uh, most of the books were written in the same way. Uh, that pattern was some, uh, some editor will ask for a work or a novel or a short story. They will keep on nagging me and uh, one moment I will agree that I will uh, give them a story or a novel and then I will be forced to sit down and write. No? Once I start writing, there is no uh, looking back or no, nothing holding me back. Otherwise, I write and rewrite and imagine things in my mind. Uh, I'll just uh, go on doing that. Uh, I may not write many of the stories I want to write. Uh, it's like that. But unless there is a, a kind of a, a, a gun pointed around my uh, to my head, I won't write. <laughs> that, that's my uh, problem. That's a big problem uh, which I face. But. Uh, I wish I have to, these days, no, age is kind of pointing a gun uh, onto my head and I think I have to finish all this, uh, all this work, which uh, the ideas I have to, I have to just, uh, it's like carrying uh, many, many worlds uh, in your head and I am so tired, I am so exhausted of this bird and I have to, to do some lot shedding. <laughs> so, I want to finish 
three or more books and then I'll enjoy my life uh, in other ways. No, See, I've works. given up all my pleasures for this, no? To keep to stick to deadlines at all. <laughs> This is such a… Uh, Hence the sympathy you have for your publishers and editors yeah, which you expressed right, earlier on. <laughs> because you rarely come across writers so sympathetic to publishers. I don't want to, to see you in jails, <laughs> in prisons, I'm sorry. Usually editors don't have very complimentary things to say yeah, about yeah. their publisher. I, I found days, that very different Earlier about it you. was not like this, but these days, no, I'm really worried about you. Just imagine needy, uh, income tax all coming to you and then uh, spoiling all the <laughs> things and all and taking you to… I don't want to <laughs> pronounce it. <laughs> so on that note, we will close. Yeah. Uh, I hope you enjoyed listening so to think, the conversation uh, see, as much the, as… My, my, uh, why, why I say this is, unless the readers support the writers and their publishers, there won't be tales for you to read. See, without stories, the world is going to be uh, quite a hell, no? I warn you. You have to support all of uh, the writers and publishers. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you, one. Thank you very Thank much you, for Mina. what you said. <laughs>